Hello, my name is Jacob, and I'm a Norse pagan. And today, I'm going to talk about the Norse god Tyr, something that I know a lot of people have been asking for a very long time. But it is something that I really wanted to be prepared for because I don't know that much about Tyr, or at least I didn't before starting to do this research, just simply because I haven't really had any Tyr experiences, and I've been observing others in the community that have. But as always, this is a God Week, which means I'm going to have two episodes about Tyr. Today, we're going to be talking about the raw facts of what we know about Tyr from the Eddas and what we know maybe from history or from artifacts. So I'm going to be sharing with you all that I could find in my research. Hopefully, it'll give you a good starting point to begin your practice or at least give you some more information. Now, where I'm filming today is kind of interesting. So I'm at a Civil War fort here in... Um, Boonesboro, uh, like near Richmond, Kentucky. So I was looking for the best place to film about here. And since he is a god of war, I wanted to do something that had to do with war. And so I was looking for civil war forts or things like that. Originally, I was going to do Fort Boonesboro, but that's closed. And so then I found this random Civil War fort sign on the side of the road, and now I'm here and I have no idea what to expect. So I'm going to begin climbing this hill and talking about Tyr along the way and maybe learning a little bit about the Civil War. So let's go ahead and begin this journey. So I'm sure most of you coming into this video already know about Tyr and Fenrir. It's the most popular and well-known Tyr story there is, and really one of the juiciest stories we have as far as information. But just because it's the most popular and well-known doesn't mean it's actually the story we get the most information. So I really want to start with the stories you might not know, just simply because I, I think that's why you're watching this video in the first place. So the story I want to start with is actually Heimaskivda, which is a lesser known story as far as Tyr. I don't hear people talking about it very often and we get a lot of information from it as well. So this is the story of Tyr and Thor traveling to Tyr's home, to Tyr's father's place, to steal a cauldron to brew beer because it's the best of all cauldrons, the biggest of all cauldrons. And so this is an interesting story because we have Tyr and Thor traveling together. Um, there is an interesting amount of information you get here and information I don't hear people talking about. So I have taken notes as you can tell. Um, I've taken these from the Poetic Edda and then the Prose Edda when we get to those stories as well. I find it easier just to write these down. That way I'm not just reading the Poetic Edda to you. So as far as the information that I wrote down that I find the most interesting and what I think will build a better image of Tyr, is first off, Tyr's father is Hymir, who is a wise giant who owns the deepest cauldron uh, to brew beer. Tyr says that he and Thor can steal the cauldron with a few tricks. Interesting. Uh, Tyr's grandmother is described as ugly with 900 heads. We see that in stanza 8. So I do my best in these series um, to not give you what that makes me think, but it is interesting. I've never heard someone talk about Tyr's grandmother having 900 heads. Hymir is described as a very large giant who can shake glaciers with his step. So here we have an example of a Jotun being large, which we see them kind of change sizes based on the story. So here we have an example of a large Jotun. It does mention that Tyr's mother, who I couldn't find the name of, it is just mentioned that she was Hymir's concubine. So we can surmise that she is most likely a Jotun as well. So Tyr is Jotun? or at the very least half Jotun or three quarter Jotun, which is not surprising because many of the gods are actually descended from Jotun as well. Even though Tyr is one of the main characters of this story, he's kind of forgotten about in the stanzas 12 to 32, where this is given to Thor on his fishing trip with Hymir, where he captures the Midgard serpent with an ox's head. And we have this very famous Thor story. Whereas with Tyr, he's kind of just left on the side and he isn't brought up until the very end of the story. And even then, the only thing that is said about Tyr is that he could not lift the cauldron once they won it from Hymir um, because uh, Thor broke Hymir's cup onto his stubborn head. Um, so Tyr tries to pick up the cauldron and actually fails, which is interesting because he is the war god. You know, I would imagine that he's quite strong. Uh, but I guess Thor is the stronger god, I suppose, is what we learn from this story because Thor easily picks it up and they begin to walk away. And as, as they're walking away from Hymir's lands, that they turn back and see that Hymir is running at them um, with an army of Jotun, who are described as lava giants. 
So we can't say for certain if Hymir is a lava giant, but we can see here that um, at least he has an army of lava giants. So this is making me sitting here thinking like, is Tyr like part fire Jotun? Maybe, it's a possibility. Again, something that I found interesting dive into the story that I don't hear people talking about very often. So what have we learned from Himskiva? Himskiva? We have learned that Tyr's father is Hymir. Um, his concubine is Tyr's mother. Hymir is described as Hymir the Wise, but he's also a very large giant, a very large Jotun. Um, gets into the fishing contest with Thor, loses, um, comes back after Thor and Tyr with his lava Jotun, um, and then is killed by Thor, um, you know, very quickly in like three lines. It's like, and then Thor killed them. So, not a lot about Tyr, but enough information that it makes you wonder. You know, this is not information that people talk about very often. The next poem I want to talk about within the Poetic Edda is Locusina, which is a poem, of course, that we get a lot of small bits of information about various deities because Loki basically insults everybody. Basically, the way Tyr comes into this is he defends Frere because Loki is obviously insulting him and he's like, Frere is one of the best of all deities. He's the kindest, uh, the most beautiful, the strongest. So Tyr does defend Frere in this situation. Um, and then we have Loki, of course, insulting Tyr, mostly about losing his hands in the binding of Fenrir. Now stanza 38 is interesting because we see Loki taught Tyr about something that we typically know him for, at least in a positive god aspect, and that's his ability to settle disputes. But Loki actually says that Tyr is unable to settle disputes and is ineffective at being a peacemaker. Now this could be in reference to Fenrir, obviously Loki is, is hurt about the fact that his son is bound and says Tyr, basically it was Tyr's fault. So maybe this is a way you can kind of look at this, um, but that's kind of up to you. But it is interesting that Loki insults his inability to settle disputes which will reference something that we read in the prose edda moving forward here very soon. So that's kind of all we get from Locusena. We get Tyr defending Freyr, which is interesting, and then we get Loki insulting Tyr about his inability to settle disputes, and then of course there is a back and forth between Tyr and Loki about the binding of Fenrir. Loki says, ha, you lost a hand to my son, and then Tyr is like, well, your son's bound forever, so that's gotta suck too, basically. Um, so not a lot there, but it is interesting little back and forth. Back when I was just a simple viewer of YouTube videos, I don't think I ever respected the amount of work that goes into getting some shots. I mean, the fact that you're seeing drone footage in this means it was a success. Now, if you're not, that means I lost the drone. <laughs> but hauling this five, six pound drone up this mountain with all my camera gear while filming, while hiking, while remembering research, it's a lot of work. So if you like the content and what I do for this channel here at the Wisdom of Odin, please think about liking and subscribing. But if you really wanna go that extra step, think about donating to Patreon. There's a link down below, and basically it just ensures the fact that I'm able to do this, still two videos roughly every single week. I'm able to do this research, go to places like this. Oh man, I need to stop recording these segments while going uphill. But seriously, if you like the content here, it would make my day if you went down below and thought about donating there. And I do have lots of benefits there, including the Patreon Discord, I have the early access videos and live streams, one of which is happening tomorrow at the time of me filming this. So thank you so much if you're able to support me there, and thank you so much for watching these videos, and I hope you're enjoying this video on tier. And now, hopefully I'm almost at the top of this hill. So this next story is actually my favorite story that I found in this research because it came from a section that I don't normally look into when it comes to the Poetic Edda. So this actually comes from the story of Sigurd Fumal. Again, apologies because I don't speak Old Norse, but I'm trying my best. This is the story of Sigurd reviving a Valkyrie who was being punished by Odin for failing him and choosing the wrong battle, the wrong victory, uh, the wrong people to win a battle. And the Valkyrie's name is Sigrafida. Sigrafida? And she basically teaches Sigurd spells, um, you know, ways to win war, and it's kind of like a mini have -em all um, So the one section that is really interesting, I'm just going to read to you. You should carve victory runes if you want to have victory. Carve some on the hilt of your sword, carve some on the middle of the blade also, some elsewhere on the sword, and name tier twice. 
So the reason I find this so interesting is because we see rune magic being used, which is not something we see in the stories all the time, and it's something that I've always struggled with in my personal runic practice. But the idea of chanting Tyr's name twice, Tiwaz, Tiwaz, or Tyr, Tyr, to activate these runes, shows that there was magic to these runes and a belief in the magic as well. And so I find this section to be one of the most potent because it shows a real-world connection with Tyr. It shows a real-world usage and a connection with victory. Like, if you want victory, carve Tiwaz into your weapons. Carve Tiwaz into what you use to achieve victory, and then chant Tyr's name twice. So this is probably, to me, one of the most exciting pieces of evidence that you can actually base a practice off of. And the whole mythos of binding a Valkyrie that failed Odin, and then releasing her by giving her a gift as well. I mean, this is a really cool story, and then the magic she teaches as well is just really exciting, and is really important for people following and wanting to connect more with Tyr. All right, I've officially reached the top of this small hill and it uh, wasn't that bad of a hike. And what I have been given is a cannon. Uh, so this is all that remains. I mean, I don't think this is original either, um, but this is all that remains of the fort itself. There is this earthen structure kind of all the way around it. If you can see that, that's what really remains of this, but still kind of a cool hike. You know, I feel like it's, it is it is a good place to be talking about. Tyr is an old Civil War fort, a uh, place that used to have some form of military standing. So now we've actually finished the Poetic Edda as far as the information that I could find, and now it is time to talk about the Prose Edda. So the Prose Edda does have quite a bit of information. I do want to go ahead and start with the information as far as the description that Snorri gives of Tyr. This comes from pages 24 and 25 of my edition. There is also an as called Tyr. He is the bravest and most valiant, and he has great power over victory in battles. It is good for men of action to pray to him. There is a saying that a man is T valiant who surpasses other men and does not hesitate. He was so clever that a man who is clever is said to be T wise. So again, this information seems to come mostly from the Poetic Edda, which is where Snorri got a lot of his resources and he expanded upon. Um, I do also want to go ahead and mention the other small bits of information in the Prose Edda before we get to the true meat and potatoes, which is the finding of Fenrir's story. On Snorri's recounting of the tale of Ragnarok, we, oh, we see mentioning that he says that Tyr is killed by Garm, the dog of hell, the, the hound of hell. Again, interesting, we see hounds being a prevalent thing within Tyr. Uh, but I don't have this in my poetic edda. It might be in another edition, but I have actually never seen mentioning of who kills Tyr at Ragnarok besides within the prose edda. So interesting that uh, Snorri knew that account. And then on page 64, the uh, part of Skaldskarper Mall, which is basically the section on how to do Skaldic verse, um, Snorri lists Victory Tier, Hang Tier, and Cargo Tier as other names for Odin. So we see Tier being used as a reference to possibly deity or god or like powerful one or something like that is what I, the research I could find, which is, you know, not something that is uncommon. It's not saying that Odin is Tier or Tier is Odin. It's just something that the name Tier is synonymous with other things within the Old Norse language. On page 76, Snorri also lists other names for Tyr within Skaldskarp and Maul, and he listed as one-handed as Feeder of the Wolf, Battle God, and Son of Odin. The Son of Odin one is interesting. I haven't seen that reference as well. Now, maybe it's because Odin is the All-Father, the father of all deities in a way. But what we know from the Poetic Edda is that Hymir is actually the father of Tyr, so he would be the son of Hymir. But again, just more information I wanted to share with you. So now here we are to the actual binding of Fenrir. Um, so the reason that I've held this off to the end of the video is because this is probably the thing that I found hardest. So I actually had a conversation with people in my Discord community um, that is available through Patreon. I was trying to really see how people understand here and how people understand the binding of Fenrir. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it to you as it is written in the prose edda, and then I want to hear your opinion on this story down below, and I'm going to share with you why this is such a, an interesting point for, for tier veneration and tier knowledge. It is one proof of his bravery that when the Aesir were luring Fenris Wolf so as to get him to the uh, fetter Gleipnir on him, he did not trust them that they would let him go until they placed Tyr's hand in the wolf's mouth as a pledge. And when the re Aesir refused to let him go, then he bit it off, the hand at the place now called the wolf's joint, the wrist, and he is one, and now he is one-handed, Is and he is not considered a promoter of settlements between people. Not considered. And then later, we have mentionings of when Fenrir first arrived in Asgard, uh, when the gods first took Fenrir as a prisoner. 
The Aesir brought up the wolf at home, and it was only Tyr who had the courage to approach the wolf and give it food. And when the gods saw how much it was growing each day, and all prophecies foretold that it was the destined to cause harm, then the Aesir adopted this plan, and they made it a strong fetter, which they called uh, Lay Ding, and brought to the wolf. And so they have they create multiple uh, ways to bind him to fail, and they finally have Gleipnir. And then uh, Tyr is mentioned when they finally try to put it on Fenrir as well. So Fenrir does speak, which is interesting that we see Fenrir, you know, a very monstrous creature, um, actually have a conversation, not something we actually see from like the world serpent at all. So the wolf said, if you bind me so that I am unable to release myself, then you will be standing by in such a way that I should have to wait a long time before I got any help from you. I am reluctant to have this bind, uh, band put on me, but rather than that, you question my courage. Let someone put his hand in my mouth as a pledge that it is done in good faith. But all the Aesir looked at each other and found themselves in a dilemma, and all refused to off their hand until Tyr put forward his right hand and put in the wolf's mouth. And now when the wolf kicked and the band grew harder and the harder he struggled, the tougher became the band. Then they all laughed except for Tyr, who lost his hand. And there you go. That is the Binding of Fenrir according to my Everyman Edda version of the Prose Edda. So the reason that I find this conversation difficult is because when I first read this, again, I want to know what you hear when you hear this story down below. But what I'm finding out is that a lot of people are filling in the blanks with what they want from this story. So I try to keep my personal viewpoints away from the Norse God series as much as possible. So here is the line for you. You know, I have read you the information, but what I read in that information, what I saw is that Tyr is a god of bravery and courage, and that only the only reason that he put his hand in Fenrir's mouth is because no other god had the bravery to do so, and he had the bravery. As it says in the very first section describing this event, it said it is one proof of his bravery when this happened, when he put his hand in the wolf's mouth. So what I'm finding, and from the conversation I was having within our Discord community, is that people see this Fenrir story as an act of compassion, an act of helping someone who is being mistreated. But that is not what I am seeing from the text. I am seeing this story as an act of bravery because Tyr is the god of war. He is a god of courage. Now, again, I know this is not going to be universal because many people see this relationship between Tyr and Fenrir of, as one of compassion, as one of maybe even love because he saw Fenrir as his, you know, as his duty, as his oath, because what, what it seems like is people read the fact that he approached Fenrir and fed him as a showing of love and compassion. But what I see it as is only an act of bravery because all the other gods were scared to do so. Again, I'm, I'm really trying to walk this line here because I, I built this channel on basically saying, look, I'm just sharing with you the information. You take that information for what you will. But it is times like these that I feel like I do need to draw a slight line in the sand and basically say, look, we might be viewing this God in the wrong way. And, you know, I never want to tell someone they're wrong and I never want to go to someone and say, your beliefs are not true about Tyr. I'm sure you have personal experiences with Tyr that, you know, circumnavigate what I'm trying to tell you right now. But what I'm saying from a historical perspective, it appears that Tyr was not a god of justice and law, that he was a god simply of bravery, courage, and war and victory. Um, so the information I have to back this up as well, it comes from the fact that the Romans saw Tyr as an equivalent to Mars. And what we see happen to Mars is very similar to what we see happen to Tyr. Because one thing you may also know that I also found in this research is that Tyr was a much more prevalent god and more of the Bronze Age, the pre-Viking Age, and that he eventually lost favor and was re kind of replaced by Odin as the chief god of war. This is also something that happened to Mars. During the early days of Rome's rise, they had Mars as their war god. He was seen as more ruthless, as more barbaric, and basically the god that got things done. He was the, the true god of war. But then as Rome became more civilized, as Rome became more about commercialism, became more about building the empire instead of expanding it through war, they replaced Mars with Minerva, which was seen more as a strategic war god. And I would argue that this was very true for the Germanic people as well, and maybe it's something they adopted from Rome or vice versa. 
but we see Tyr as more of the war victory god and perhaps was more prominent in an earlier era. But then as we got closer to the era where we have written information about deities, Odin was more prominent at that time because at that time during the Viking Age, um, Scandinavia and the areas that worship these deities were becoming more civilized and so Odin may have replaced Tyr as more of a strategic war god. Okay, so I'm not used to making arguments on this channel, but I, again I hope this is enough information to perhaps even just alter your perspective or look at Tyr in a different way because again the information that we're seeing we have mentionings that Tyr is not considered a good god for negotiation and peacemaking. We have Loki referencing this as well, that Loki says he is not good at settling arguments. Um, we see him wanting to play tricks on Hymir um, to steal the cauldron. He is from possibly a fire giant. And then we have the victory runes as well, backing the idea that he was really used as, as the martial god, the war god, to achieve victory. And then, of course, in the prose edit, we have the repeated reference to Tyr being of bravery and courage. So that is my argument. So please let me know down below what you think of this, because again, it seems to be a different perspective that I have not heard before, and is what I saw doing this research. And I wanna know your perspective down below. I'm, you know, I don't wanna say I'm 100% right on this. Everyone has a different perspective, and again, everyone has different personal experiences with Tyr. But again, it's one of the reasons I was kind of afraid to make this video, because I knew I was going to have to probably step outside of my comfort zone and, and maybe you know, argue for a point that I see within the story of Tyr. So if I haven't completely lost you with my argument, I do have a little bit more information from you and that comes in the form of artifacts. And so the first one and the most prominent that I found is this gold bracteat, which we see um, other references of and they recently found that dig site in Denmark, which had even more of these. Um, and there is one that references a figure that most likely is Tyr because we see a figure with his hand being bit by a wolf. Now it doesn't say directly on there, this is Tyr or Tiwaz, but it does look pretty much like this story and I can't imagine this being any other deity so it seems like most people accept this as Tyr and a representation of him um, and this was found in Sweden. So the other interesting bit of information doesn't exactly reference Tyr but it references Mars and it was found near Hadrian's Wall um, within the British Isles and there is an engraving which is a prayer to the war gods for victory and that exact thing comes from the Alias, alias uh, Gay, the Aliasia Gay? Yeah, I'll see gay. So, again, apologies. I'll put all the information right here because I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, but it says to the god Mars and to um, Alias Gay, Beta and Feminilia, and the divine spirit of the emperor, the German tribesmen from Tuhantis willingly and deservedly fulfill their vow. So we can't say for certain if this is a reference to Tyr, but it is a clearly a German person saying that they, you know, are honoring a war god or they had a vow to a war god. And they call it Mars, but to a Germanic person, if they came from an actual Germanic village, most likely it was Tyr, and they're just calling it Mars because of the Roman influence. Again, just an interesting little factoid I wanted to make sure I shared with you. So that is actually all I have for this video on the information we have with Tyr. Again, I'm not saying this is all the information, and if you know more and you know stories that I didn't find here, please put them down below, because I want to learn more and I want other people to learn more as well. So this is a little bit different than most Norse God videos I have made, because I have made kind of an argument here, um, and I maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't. Um, there's going to be several different ways people view this story, and I just personally view this story as an act of bravery and bravery alone. So thank you so much for joining me for this video, this slight adventure on top of this hill. I hope I haven't completely lost you. And otherwise, please make sure you check out the second episode, which comes out on Friday, which is going to be talking about how we honor Tyr today. So thank you all very much. And until the hall, Skull.